Uh, hi, good morning everyone. How are we doing this fine Friday morning? <laughs> Bright and early. Great! Woo! Okay, um, so I'm Urvashi Monani. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat on the OpenShift Runtime Steam, working mainly with Cryo, Podman, Builder, and Scopio. Um, so all the low-level container tools that we use nowadays. Uh, and this is... Oh, yep, I'm Sally. Um, I'm also an engineer. I work on the OpenShift um, team. I. I work on some different OpenShift components like API server and authentication. Um, I use Podman and these tools every day, but I'm actually not um, writing the code for them. Uh, so all the hard questions will just defer to Urvashi. But um, yeah, it's my uh, when I started at Red Hat though, I was on the containers team, and things are way different. Um, back when I started, we were submitting pull requests to upstream Docker, um, pretty much. The Docker container exploded on the scene. Everybody ad started adopting it, and that was the only tool um, available. Uh, we at Red Hat were carrying a bunch of different patches on Docker in our own branch, and that's what we, we were shipping, and things that um, we thought were important uh, with regards to security and other features that um, Docker just hadn't, hadn't accepted yet, or um, PRs were closed or whatever. So you can go back in history, uh, look at a blog that Dan wrote. Um, he lists all of the patches that we had and the PRs and such. It's an interesting read, but anyways. Uh, around that time, uh, another company, CoreOS, was developing a container tool, um, Rocket. And so lots of other companies were getting interested and wanting to um, develop tools. And it was going to be very difficult without a set of standards around what is a container. And so the OCI was formed. Um, some companies like CoreOS, Red Hat, Docker, um, Google, IBM, all the big names, they got together and came up with some open industry standards um, for what is a container image and what is a container runtime. This was really important in propelling things forward because now any container image could run, can run on any runtime as long as you adhere to OCI. So what OCI is not, and if you were at Dan's talk, you saw this yesterday, we stole it from him. Um, OCI is not a movement started by Dan to get um, open containers laws changed and be able to drink beer on the streets or in your car. So just so you know, somebody stopped him. Uh, he was on the street with that jacket, and someone stopped him and was like, are you really advocating for open containers laws to be changed? So yeah, we just want to nip that in the bud. <laughs> Uh, so before we go on, we want to just be all on the same page. It seems like most of you are, but I prepared this, so I'm going to say it. Um, con containers, they are ordinary Linux processes running, um, and they are constrained, they're isolated, and they have extra security. Um, processes are constrained using Linux C groups. C groups control how much of a system resource like CPU, memory, bandwidth, uh, a process can consume on your system. Um, namespaces, Linux namespaces um, give you an isolated view of your system with regards to a resource. So uh, for example, if I'm in a container, I'm in a PID namespace. Um, if I'm inside that container and I have a shell, if I ran the PS command, <coughs> I would only see the processes in the PID namespace. I would have no idea. I would have no access to, I couldn't view any processes running on the host. Same thing with mount namespace. Um, if I'm in, say, an Ubuntu container, I have the root file system of Ubuntu um, in the mount namespace, <coughs> and that gives me the feeling that I'm on an Ubuntu system. Um, that's the idea with Linux namespaces. And then um, extra security, I think I already said that. That's yeah. Linux, yeah. So in order to have a running container, you need a container image, and that is nothing special or magic. It's a tarball um, made up of layers. The base layer is usually a root file system like a Fedora or Ubuntu or Alpine and whatever, um, and a JSON file description of uh, certain things like environment variables, um, entry point commands, 
things like that are put in the JSON file description. And then layer upon layer, um, if I had, say, I wanted an Apache Fedora image, I would install the Apache package into and commit it into a new layer, and then update it with the JSON file, tar all that up. That is a container image. Uh, in order to run a container image, you need a container engine that knows how to launch the container runtime. So in a container engine is a program that, know, that can take the container image, reassemble that tarball um, extract onto your local system, and it uses a copy on write file system when it, for that um, because, say I have 10 Fedora Image it, 10 Fedora, I want to run 10 Fedora containers, 10 Fedora images. Um, I only need one copy of that base layer. I don't need 10 copies of the base layer. That's copy on write allows for sharing of layers. Uh, and so the container engine, like Podman, Cryo, Doc, uh, Container D, yeah. Um, takes the, the JSON description of the image and takes any user input. Like when you pass the run command, you might pass a port or um, uh, interactive or TTY. It takes all of that information and combines it into a new JSON file that it uses then to launch the runtime. 99% of the containers we've used use the runtime of run C. Um, you know, Docker, Cryo, Podman, we all use Run-C, but um, any OCI runtime um, can be used. There's others like C-Run and um, G Gvisor, Kata containers, there's others. So now we're, we all know what, it, what all of that, and we can move on. Yeah. So Sally gives an awesome introduction of what containers are. Um, so now that we know that the container space can actually be broken down into four different sets of action. These are building container images, running and testing your containers locally, storing and sharing your container images, and finally running them in a container and a production environment. Um, now, each of these actions have very different security requirements. For example, you need way more privileges to build container images than you need to like run container the production cluster. So imagine what would happen if we had all these actions happening in a monolithic tool. Uh, we would obviously end up with the least common denominator when it comes to security, uh, which is pretty terrible, sacrificing security just so you have all the functionality in one place. Uh, so following the meme on this slide here, uh, our goal here is to deliver better and more secure tools for your container workload. Um, hence, we decided to follow the Unix philosophy, which states that you should design tools to do one thing, to do it well, and to work well with other programs. Um, as you can see here, the Unix founders are really happy that we decided to follow their awesome philosophy. <laughs> uh, so we had four container tools were born out of that. Um, Builda, the name says it all, for building container images. Podman, for running and developing containers and pods locally. Um, Scopio, for sharing and storing these container images. And finally, Cryo for running your containers in a production cluster such as Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, and all these tools, including OpenShift, come together to form the amazing container commandos. They are the superheroes of the container world and are here to save us all. <laughs> So um, over the last year, the communities surrounding the four tools have really grown, um, and that's that's why we wanted to come back and share more with you about the tools. Um, we're going to go through some of the new features that have been added over the past year. Um, the first one is Builda. <coughs> Builda is the tool for building um, container images. Uh, when you build container images, you want to build them securely. Um, the first thing that you would think about is um, only put in your image what you need to run your program. So building minimal images, um, Builder was designed to do that um, easily. Um, with all of our tools, there are there is no, no daemon. Uh, that's really important uh, for being, because of that you can run all of our tools without root, um, and our image builds are, can be truly containerized. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Because over the past year, year and a half even, we've been working on updating OpenShift from OpenShift 3 to 4. And it was released this year. And uh, Builda is the, contain is the tool used in OpenShift 4 for building images. Um, and we, we use Builda containerized in OpenShift. And because there is no daemon, uh, there's no information being 
um, there's no information being leaked from the Docker socket file to the container when we're building images. It's, it's really made our image builds in OpenShift much more secure. Also, Builda is the default image build tool in RHEL 8 over the past year that happened too. Yep, and we have some awesome demos for you all. They're all live. Hopefully the one we just changed up works. We yeah. <laughs> if not, it's all right. So again, Builda makes building minimal images very um, easy. And it did work. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, build it from scratch. It sets up the scaffolding of what is a container. It sets up the C groups, the namespaces, but there's nothing in it. Uh, it will spit out a working container. Um, from there, you can set a mount point to that working container and use your host system package manager to install whatever you want in your container image. Rather than having to have the package man manager inside the image, now you can just use your host system and move or copy or install anything you need. Um, we've installed our one single package that we needed, which was BusyBox. And um, now that we have that, we can remove the mount point and commit that working container with build a commit to a new image. So we called the image minimal image. So now when we run the image, you can see that it's completely locked down. You can't ping. There's no Python. Um, all that's in that image is BusyBox. That's the idea with minimal images. You just shrink your attack surface. And the more that's in your image, the more it can go wrong. Uh, so, um, do you want to talk about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So another feature that we have in um, Builda is building with Dockerfile.in. So uh, I, there have been cases where you usually want to build multiple images for different distros, but you basically want to do the same thing in each image. So you'll have like ten lines that are exactly the same across like three, four different Docker files. Uh, so instead of copy and pa copying and pasting these lines across all the four Docker files, you can just create um, one Docker file, the bottom one that's the Docker file, the lowercase, and you can have um, all the common lines in there. You can, we use a CPP processor to do this, so you can use the pound if def, pound include, pound define um, functionality of that. And uh, so as you can see here, I have two Docker files, fedora.in and ubuntu.in. So in Fedora, I want to start from a Fedora-based image, and I just want to like um, echo I'm Fedora in it. But for the Ubuntu, when I'm building for an Ubuntu, I want to install HTTPD. Um, so as you can see here, I have done a bound include Docker file in both the fedora.in and ubuntu.in files, so I don't have to copy and paste these common lines across. Um, another cool feature is that you can also do an if else statement, so you like if you are doing a Fedora one, you can do DNF install, versus if you're doing app, um, Ubuntu, you can tell it to do app get install instead. Um, so I'm just going to quickly build that Ubuntu uh, image, and as you can see, it built, and we can find my image here. <laughs> we forgot to clean up our images. Yeah, it's called my Ubuntu. It's right there. Uh, and then same with Fedora. I didn't do DNF install because it was going to sit and take forever to run <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, so I just made an echo and Fedora in there. And once this is done, hurry up. <laughs> um, Something went wrong, but okay. <laughs> but yeah, it basically built that image. Uh, so it's just more of enhancing user experience, making it easier for developers. You don't have to sit and copy and paste things around. You just have one file with the common lines and all. So that's Dockerfile.in for you. It started the next yeah, demo. Yeah, it started the next demo. Uh, okay, so this demo, uh, so. When it comes to processes, there's always been this long-going battle between speed versus security. Um, usually, and the same applies for when you're building container images. So usually when you want to maximize the security for your uh, build process, you're going to be sacrificing on speed. And the same is true for vice versa. Uh, so keeping that in mind, we actually designed build uh, to allow users to explore with and discover what balance works for them best. Some people prefer fully locked down even if it's slow. Some people for really fast, even if it's completely unsafe, and there's like a good and there's another technique of keeping a good balance of safety and um, speed. And so when we incorporated build it and OpenShift, that was a that's a constant yeah. discussion going on with the balance between performance and security. security. 
Yeah. So uh, there are three scenarios here, and the three ways you can do build, uh, build processes in Belda. So the first one that I already ran, I basically have a podman command, and I'm running Belda into the container. I'm not even building an image. I'm just trying to pull the UBI8 image. And um, as you can see, it took 14 seconds to run that. Uh, and in this case, it's completely secure. SE Linux is enabled. I'm not mounting any uh, container storage volume into the container. The process is completely isolated between the host and the container. So this is your most locked down method. This is your slowest method. Uh, the next one is your fastest method, which is the most non-secure method. Um, in this one, as you can see, I'm volume mounting the container storage on the host into the container. So now if the host container engine has already pulled down an image, the container already has access to it now and doesn't have to reach out to the registry to pull it down. So you're saving time on that. And then um, since I'm giving my container right, I need to give my container right access to that path, I have to disable SE Linux. That's why the security opt label equals disable um, flag is there. So this is completely unsecure. SE Linux is not blocking anything here. Uh, and uh, But it's the fastest. Like, And if this is what you want, you prefer faster security, you do you. It's up to you. We've given you the option to do that. <laughs> Uh, and then the last scenario is a good balance between security and speed. Uh, so we have something called additional stores in Builder where you can tell Builder that uh, this is a read-only store. You, uh, you can pull images that are already pulled down to that store. You don't give it right access to the store. Uh, so we're doing that over here. We're volume mounting the container storage on the host to varlib shared, which is like additional store, and we're setting as read-only. So the container processes do not have any permissions to write to that path, and it cannot change any content on the host uh, container storage. So future container runs will definitely not be affected. So you're basically like 90% locked down in the scenario. Uh, but then you're still giving it the database from the host, in, the image database from the host into the container. So you're leaking that much information in. And uh, because of that, it's already cached. And you don't have to reach out to the registry again to pull it down. So as you can see, that actually ends up being faster <laughs> than the second scenario. It's already in the cache. Yeah. So it's right. like so about two seconds to run that versus the 14 seconds in your most upstairs secure that method. Took, upstairs is when we practiced. It took like 23 seconds seconds for the top. Yeah. So it, I mean, this one's on the internet speed as well. But yeah, so these are the three different ways that you can balance your security and your speed and choose on what is more important to you when building container images. OK, back oh, to Oh, cool. Slides. We're back to Podman. So Podman, actually, I, I would say, has the most uh, new features, features in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like once I'm done building my container image, I like to like play around with it locally. And for that, Podman is the great all-in-one container CLI tool. Uh, you can do everything from building container images to running in uh, containers and pods. Uh, Podman also uses build under the hood, so tying back to Unix philosophy, create tools that work, do one thing and work well together. And Podman replicates the whole Docker CLI and adds much more on top of it as well. Um, same thing as a theme, as Dan Walsh said, hashtag no big fat demons. We have no demons running for Podman. Uh, you can run without truth this way, so security, uh, focus on our security there. Podman version 1.0 was released earlier this year in January, and it's now the default container CLI tool in RHEL 8. Uh, it's fully supported by Red Hat, and we no longer have Docker. <laughs> Um, over the past year, uh, we have added a bunch of new features to Podman, specifically focusing on user experience enhancement. Uh, these are some of the features that have been added. Uh, Podman Pod, as the command says, it's the full CLI tool to create your pods, play with your pods, do whatever you want, sort of replicating how pods and containers work in a Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster. Um, the other command we added is checkpoint and restore. So, uh, let's say, so let's say you're running a bunch of containers that are doing some database processing and everything, but all of a sudden you need to reboot your machine. And you don't want to lose the progress. Um, so with Checkpoint, you can checkpoint all these containers. Podman will save its state at that point, and you can reboot your machine easily. When you restore it back, it will pick up exactly from that point. So you don't lose anything, and you don't lose any, you don't have to start from scratch again and have to wait again for all the whole database processes to happen. So um, pretty cool for like people who like to use um, containers and databases together. Uh, and the next feature is my favorite one out of all of them. <laughs> it's Podman Generate Cube and Podman Generate Systemd. 
So usually when I'm playing with my pods and containers with Podman, it's super easy to launch containers and pods at the point of just Podman run, some image, some command, right? Uh, so add in some two, three flags there, do what you want. And once I spent some time perfecting what I wanted to do, then, I real, then I'm thinking like, okay, now I have to make this run in a Kubernetes cluster and an OpenShift cluster. I have to go and now write YAML and JSON files for that to happen. I have to go like kind, pod, name, my pod, yada, yada, yada. So and then... Your online YAML yeah, checker. Yeah. yeah. And I usually don't remember exactly how the YAMLs go. Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't remember the other back of my hands. I'm usually Googling how do I do this and how do I do that. Um, but Podman generate, you can pass in a pod, you can pass in a container, and it will literally go through it and create the YAML file you need to run it in a Kubernetes cluster. Then you just pick that, plug it in, and your pods and containers are launched as they were with Podman. You so can use kubectl or OC if you're OC. running OpenShift yeah. to create it. Yeah, so very NFT feature for developers. Uh, same thing for systemd, you can also generate systemd files that way. Um, so with um, systemd files and containers, uh, it's a way to um, launch a container, say, on startup. Yeah. Um, we don't have a, a uh, a daemon. daemon for our containers, so we just use what everybody uses for everything else. That's system daemon. Yeah. So we don't have something like Podman Auto Start like Docker does, because we just don't have a daemon. Um, yeah, and then another one is Podman and Share. If you all have been using Builder, I'm sure you've used Builder and Share before. It basically just puts you in a user namespace, uh, replicates a container environment, and you can do stuff in that. Uh, and now, so this is a pretty big thing. Podman is going to start using C Groups V2 in the coming in the near future. It'll be the only container runtime supporting that, and that shows our dedication to further improving techno tools in the container realm. And finally, a big feature that's coming along pretty well, and it's been, our intern actually has been working on it all summer, is Podman Remote, which lets you use Podman on a Mac or Windows machine. And we will talk about that a bit later in the talk. And yeah, so, yeah. more demos. <laughs> so uh, this... This demo we've showed before, and actually Dan, we share it with Dan too, so he showed it yesterday, but um, it's the Podman runs with a true fork exec model, and, and rather than the client server model. Um, that's important when auditing a system for, for knowing who's running what on your system. Fork exec is, is important. So on a Linux system, um, if you cat proc self login UID, that will give you the UID of the person that's currently logged into the system. It does not change whether you um, go into a container, you gain, you know, you use sudo, you're always going to be um, logged as that user. Um, so with the fork exec model, if I run a podman run command and I go inside the container and look at the login UID file, you can see it carries through and it's 1,000. Um, as you'd expect. If I do the same exact command with Docker, um, I'll get uh, something different. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, signifies that it's a user who has never been, who has never logged into the system. It, it translates to negative one or unsigned 32 bit in, something like that. Um, You'll always get this the same log the same value when you're running Docker containers, and um, that's because that's the Docker daemon. So, showing this another way, if I set up some audit logs for a sensitive file like Etsy Shadow, if I have the ability to run Podman as sudo, launch a privileged container, there's nothing stopping me from mounting the hosts and making a change to Etsy Shadow. But if I go into the audit logs that I've set up, uh, you can see that Urvashi, <laughs> I've taken over Urvashi, so actually this is, I'm, I'm still not going to get caught, but Urvashi is um, messing around with Etsy Shadow. And if I do the same thing with Docker, you can see now that in the audit logs it says the unset user has been making changes to Etsy Shadow. So um, that's a really cool way of showing uh, how important the fork exec is when auditing and knowing who's running what. All right, so um, as I said, we added Podman pod in the last year, uh, just a way of creating pods. So I can do Podman pod create, and that will create a pod for me. 
When I do a pod list, you can see um, this is the pod that was created, the first one. It's the one that says created it's two seconds ago. <laughs> uh, I can see the. And what, it has one container in it. It has one container. Yes, I can see the containers running inside it and has an infrared container which basically sets up all your networking and everything you need for your pod and containers to run. Yeah, so every, every time you run Podman Pod, that one infrared container will be started, started without. You don't have to start it. And, and that's what sets up the, um, the pod namespaces and. Yeah. and such. Yeah. So now I can create a container inside the pod by uh, doing a podman run and giving the pod flag the pod ID. Uh, so I'm creating an so alpine she's, container. So she's starting just a simple alpine yeah, container inside that pod. Yeah. And then when I do a podman PS, I pod PS, I can see if you remember my state was created up here, and now that I have an actual contain another container apart from the infrared container running inside it, now it's showing that my pod is actually running. Um, this is probably going to fail, yeah. So. Oh, yeah, because you just have the flags. So flag. I can That's do it all. here. Um, so if I if I do podman ps-a-pod, that will show me containers that are running inside pods right now. And this is the one that I just ran. Um, yeah, so that's it. And you can, uh, if you stop a pod, it will stop all the containers, clear it up for you. Basically, like how pods and containers work in clusters. So I would um, encourage you to go look, run the latest Podman and do Podman Pod help. And you can see the help menu of what's available for Podman Pod. There's also a command um, Podman container. Um, if you're using Checkpoint and Restore, that's a Podman container command. So if you do Podman container help, you'll see all of the um, options there. And then there's also just the Podman help menu. So right. um, Podman container um, is used with. Just want to do this? Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Yes. Podman container is used when you're um, running Podman cube generate. Podman generate cube. So here I have an OpenShift cluster. Can you see that off to the side on the right? Yeah, you you see enough. Um, I have my OpenShift cluster running in the cloud. It's running in AWS, and I have my. Um, I'm going to show you Podman generate cube. So here I'm going to make it a little smaller. <laughs> Make sure you, can you guys see that still? Okay, so I'm running the command. Uh, well, first, here's the Docker file that I built for my Hello OpenShift image that I want to run in OpenShift. Um, it's just an Alpine image, and I have a simple binary that spits out Hello OpenShift, web, simple web server. And so um, Podman um, supports these run labels, and I passed a run label to my Docker file. So what that does is every time I run this image, this command will run, the Podman run, give it the name hello, um, set up the port, and run it in the background. So um, now I can pass Podman. I'm going to set up a container, run label, and I'm going to give it that image. And the, the, that pod, that container is running in the background. Uh, and you can see if I look at the logs, they're um, just serving there. Um, you can see it's running. Now, podman generate cube. Here's the help menu for it. Um, you pass it a running container, and it will spit out a YAML file that you can upload to OpenShift or Kubernetes. So here, I'm going to pass Podman Generate Cube with my running container. And here's the YAML. Uh, that looks good. I've checked it out. So I'm going to um, save that to a local file. And here, I want to make sure I'm in the right place. You're in the right project. Oh, I am? OK. So I have, I'm in a Hello OpenShift project, and I'm going to show you my pods, which I have no pods. But I can um, run OC Create and up a pod has spit up, has spun up, sorry. <laughs> and uh, is, I want to make sure it's running before I. Yep, it's running. There we go. It's a really simple pod, so there's, there's nothing that's going to block it. Um, you can describe it. But now 
I'm going to use just some simple OC commands. So if I run OC expose um, pod, it will set up a service. You could just create a service if you know the YAML for service, but Open, OpenShift is um, the distribution of Kubernetes that makes Kubernetes really user friendly. So we've added commands like OC expose um, because we know that if you have a pod and you're going to want a service. So here, um, oh, I wanted to show, show my service. I missed it, but a service has popped up, and I'm not going to miss this time because now, once I have a service, I can run OC Expose again and uh, look at when you run OC Expose on a service, which I will do, you'll get a route. And there, my route popped up, uh, and now. I'm, I'm showing you, right and left, I'm showing you um, command line managing OpenShift and the web console managing OpenShift. I'm just doing the same thing in both. So here I can curl that route and I should see hello OpenShift. Yay! Uh, or I can go over here and show it as well. There's hello OpenShift. So um, that's Podman Generate Cube is something that the Podman team has been working on for the past year. It's new. Uh, we're really, they'd really love it if you had some new stuff to add to it. So, you know, submit pull requests, RFEs, what, yeah. whatever. It's still up and coming. And you saw how easy that was just to convert that account generator image you built, convert it to a YAML file and run with OC. So, yeah. Uh, and then, all right. So that's for Podman. Oh, good. We're done with Podman. Yeah. Now we're moving on to Scopio. Uh, so Scopio is a pretty simple and really nice tool that you use to share your container images. The biggest feature about this is that you can easily move your container images from registry A to registry B without even having to download it or from any container storage to another container storage. Uh, and you can also inspect remote images. So it goes and grabs the JSON that gives you all the information of what the image is. So the digest, the repo tags, um, who wrote the author when it was created, etc so you know exactly where you're going to download. Same thing as Podman and Builder, no big fat daemons. We have no daemon running here. And as Podman and Builder, it's also the other default container tool in RHEL 8. So Scopio um, was the first container commando. I was trying to make a joke about you know Captain America being the first Avenger. <laughs> uh, Scopio uh, was the first one to break away and start the whole container commando revolution. So she's very important. Uh, so a quick, quick demo. This is my favorite meme, by the way. <laughs> my creating containers to cloud. <laughs> uh, so pretty quick demo here on Scopio. I'm just, uh, if you want to, let's say, move your images, uh, move an image from Doc your storage that's used by Docker to the storage used by Podman on Cryo and Scopio. It's a pretty simple command, Scopio copy. Uh, Docker daemon is just telling uh, Scopio that pick it up from the Docker storage, and stor our storage is called container storage, and so move it there. So I'm going to move that over. Probably already had it, so skipped over it. Um, we also made our pull and push much better, actually. Uh, yeah. It's much faster now from last year. <laughs> Parallel. Yeah. Um, pulls um, in. Yeah, so you'll see Ubuntu demo right here. And I was able to easily move over. Uh, we plan to enhance Scopio a bit more where you can easily like um, mirror registries. You just do Scopio sync and it will copy over all the images from one repo in a registry to another. And just to make, as we said, our, our goal is for user experience enhancement. And just to add, um, I use these tools every day, but I usually am running like build a build commands, and so I use build a push to push up to my Quay registry. Um, build a push actually uses the same library as Scopio, it's container slash images. Yeah. And so, um, again, all of these tools just work well together. That's that's the goal. That's the design of her. Also, Scopio is actually pretty underrated. Uh, it's actually it's a very simple and nice tool. So if you're running in a cluster and you're running a script and all you want to do is move container images around and stuff like that, then you don't actually have to install Podman because Podman gives you so much more. You can just have a small, simple tool, Scopio, to do all that for you. And that's actually what we use when we do our missions for OpenShift and all. So um, if you ever go to see the install, well, the install Installer file looks like it has a bunch of Scopio copy, Scopio move, Scopio this, and all. So it's actually a very, it's a really good tool that's pretty underrated. <laughs> all right. So now we're up to Cryo, and yeah. 
If you, if any of you are at KubeCon in Barcelona or look or watch the keynotes at KubeCon in Barcelona, you would have seen Urvashi. She was up at the keynote um, announcing that Cryo has joined CNCF. Yeah. So at this point, I'm just going to step aside and let Urvashi talk about Cryo. She's also a Cryo maintainer. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So after you've built your container images and you've tested it, pushed it to your registry, the next step now is to run it in a production cluster. And that's where Cryo comes in. Um, Cryo stands for Container Runtime Interface OCI. What this means is Cryo is OCI compliant. It follows the OCI image spec and the runtime spec. You can plug in any OCI compliant runtime to it, like Run C, um, Kata, GVisor. So we have a C run now, which is the C implementation of Run C. Uh, and all that. Uh, so what Cryo does, it's the interface between the Kubernetes CRI API. So it has a lightweight daemon because it needs to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API. Uh, and then it tells the container runtime, so like run C and all, like, oh, I need to launch. So basically, if Kubernetes is like, oh, I want to launch a Fedora container, so Cryo will go up to the registry, pull it down, if it's not already locally there, store it on disk, and then we'll tell run C, here's the image, these are all the settings I want to do, and just launch this container for me. Um, so that's what Cryo does, it's the interface. Uh, as Sally mentioned, we joined the CNCF earlier this year as an incubator project, and Cryo is the only runtime now in OpenShift 4.x clusters, so we're fully out there live. Uh, Cryo's main focus is to make running uh, containers in production as boring and as secure as possible. Uh, focusing on our security, we have the users can easily enable read-only mode. Which, what this means is that all your processes and your containers will be running in read-only mode. They won't have permissions to write to any path in the container except of what is volume mounted in. So if you ever get attacked and someone tries to install something in it, they won't be able to because it's all read-only. Uh, another thing is Cryo's FIPS mode compliant. Uh, it's one of the only container tools that does that. So if you're running on a FIPS compliant machine and you launch a container, the Cryo can detect that it was in FIPS mode. So it would know, it would be able to block the crypto algorithms that are not allowed by FIPS mode. And uh, one of the biggest features that got into Cryo and actually all our other tools as well is registry mirroring. Uh, what this means is that if you have registry A and B, and B is a mirror of A, it has all the contents A has, and you tell Cryo, I want to launch a container from this image from registry A, but for some reason A is down or can't be reached, Cryo will know to fall back to B and automatically pull it from B and continue your process. This is especially useful when you're in a disconnected environment where you don't want to be connected to the internet and you have a local registry. And, and uh, when you say um, Cryo is for running in production, uh, it's really for running in Kubernetes. Yeah. Cryo was designed, built for only running in Kubernetes. Yeah. And so, yeah. And because of that, so we actually walk in lockstep with the Kubernetes version. So if you're running Kubernetes 113, you know you have to run Cryo 113. You don't have to go look up a map and like I'm 114 and I have to run Cryo 0 0.10 something. So you ex always know exactly which version you need. Um, yeah, and last demo is, so. Is this a mirroring? Yeah, this is a mirroring. So I'm gonna demo how the mirroring works. Okay, so I have a local registry running right now in my VM. I'm going to start my mirror script. Okay, so I'm gonna use Scopio to copy an image I have in my Docker repository, a Docker repository to my local registry. And um, I'm gonna do that pretty quickly. See how easy that was? <laughs> and then I'm going to get the digest. I knew that was going to fail, but I already have the digest. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so with mirroring, it only works when you're pulling by digest, just because digest always guarantees that you're going to get the exact same image regardless of which registry it's on. It make, the digest will be the same if all your content and your manifest and everything are exactly the same. Um, so the SHA, right? the SHA yeah. Uh, so this is what, so then we have a registry.conf file where you can set up the mirroring rules. As you can see here, I have set up uh, docker.io slash yumhunani. So it happens on a repository level, not a registry level. You can do registry level as well, but we prefer a repository level. And then my mirror, I set it up to um, that localhost 5000 my repo mirrors docker.io slash yumhunani. And um, what I'm going to do now, so, uh, I'm going to block my VM from accessing the internet. Um, and then if I run thing, you will see it's not being able to access the internet. Just to prove to you that I'm no longer talking <laughs> to the internet, there's 100% packet loss. Uh, 
I'm going to do Podman images. I don't have that image yet there. You will see it because it will be a long digest one. And now I'm going to pull it. And as you see, so even though it shows it pulls from docker.io umunani, but it doesn't. I have no access to the internet. It can't reach out to the Docker Hub. And that proves that it actually pulled from my local registry. Uh, and now I have to put my images. You see that long, this image here with the long shell. Yeah, I just got that in. And that's how I'm wearing works. Uh, so now uh, uh, I can just show you that it works. I'm going to run a container with a pod with cryo, run a container, start it up, and my container is up and running, as I would if I had just pulled the image from Docker. Uh, so yeah, so now imagine like uh, in an OpenShift cluster, imagine you're in a disconnected environment. Some users like have to be disconnected just because of security reasons. They don't want to be connected to the internet. And having this, like with Cryo, you're giving OpenShift that feature to be able to install from scratch as disconnected. You just mirror everything, all your images, your release payload. So local registry, tell OpenShift this is where you should do it. Set up all these mirroring rules, and everything will be seamlessly installed for you. And that's a pretty big feature we also added in OpenShift. So yeah, again, that work is um, for running disconnected, disconnected. clusters. Yeah. So all right. So getting there. Oh, what? sorry. Can that was one more demo? that was misplaced. This is first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just wanted to quickly um, remind you to run your containers as non-root whenever possible and enable SC Linux um, because. Almost every um, almost every CVE that's come out with containers has been a, a file system exploit, and those can be um, completely prevented if you are running with SE Linux and running as non-root. Um, for example, this one came out in the past year. It was a big run C um, CVE, and it affected all pretty much every container uh, image everywhere, and. Um, it, uh, the exploit was that a process could escape and overwrite the run C binary and then make it do whatever it wanted to do on the host. So it was a really bad one. Uh, but fortunately, at Red Hat, we were pretty much OK because, um, A, we don't run random images off the internet. Um, we run as non-root. That's the default in OpenShift. That's why we run. We don't allow containers to run as root in OpenShift. And, um, Set in force one um, that because the run C runs with um, uh, container runtime exec T, uh, the container processes are container T. Only container T types can write to files labeled container file T. Uh, so container file T does not equal container runtime exec T. So um, SE Linux blocks being able to write the run C file. Yeah, so SE Linux was really the only thing that was blocking it. Um, and running without root was definitely helping, but SE Linux. So remember earlier when I showed you the fastest build process by disabling SE Linux? This, this is what can happen if you do that. <laughs> All right. Sorry so. to interrupt, folks, but we are running really close on time. Just if you wanted to. Can we? Do we have just one two, more minute? Can we just do two minutes more? Yeah, we're like two minutes away from scheduled end. So if you wanted to open for questions, I just wanted to let you know. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a pretty quick Podman remote demo from our intern here. And we can here. take any questions out in the uh, hall. We can take questions in the hall after. We really want her to demo this. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Ashley. I'm an intern um, on the uh, Container Runtimes team, and so I've been working on the Podman remote, um, basically packaging it and making it smooth uh, so it's easy to install and run. So right now I don't have Podman installed, but I can just do a, uh, if anybody's familiar with Macs, you know Homebrew is like the default package manager that everybody uses. so I can do a broadcast install Podman. Um, and it will install Podman uh, really quickly. And then um, right now I have uh, my connection um, to my host, which is my Linux machine sitting right there, and that's the IP address. And cool. um, just and then so now I can just pretend Podman is uh, running on my local machine, um, uh, and then it should show the pods that I have run, uh, that are on my uh, Linux machine. And it just kind of looks like it's running on my Mac, but it's actually running on my Linux machine. And that's the remote um, aspect in play. 
for Podman, and it's it's done using Varli uh, Varlink um, bridge and uh, using. I, so I have a Varlink socket running on my uh, Linux machine, and it SSHs into. Uh, it communicates through SSH. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs>